What's the uh, the biggest mistake you've ever made in your life, and how did you recover? Uh, I've made a class of mistakes that I would summarize in the same way, uh, and I uh, made this class of mistakes, uh, and, and, and it was obvious to, to me what these mistakes were only in hindsight through one exercise, which is you've probably heard the you know when you're 30, what advice would you give your 20 year old self? Yeah. And when you're 40, like what advice would you give your 20 or your 30 year old self? So if you do that exercise decade by decade, or maybe if you have, if you're younger, you can do it in five. Minutes. Really sit down and say. Okay, you know, 2007, what was I doing? How was I feeling? 2008, what was I doing? How was I feeling? 2009, what was I doing? How was I feeling? And at least for me, this remarkable consistency emerged. And that consistency was that uh, everything that I was doing, I should have still done, but with less emotion and especially less anger, because I used to be very angry when I was younger, Um, but especially just less emotion. Life is going to play out the way it's going to play out. Some good some bad but most of it is actually just up to your interpretation i mean you're born you have a set of sensory experiences then you die and how you choose to interpret those sensory inputs is up to you and different people just interpret them in different ways but really i wish i had done all of the same things but with less emotion and less anger uh, like the most celebrated example would be you know when i was younger i started a company and the company did well but i didn't do well so i sued some of the people involved and it was a good outcome for me in the end and Everything worked out okay, but there was a lot of angst and a lot of anger. And really, today, you know, what I would do is I wouldn't go down the angst and the anger. I would have just walked up to the people and said, look, this is what happened. This is what I'm going to do. This is how I'm going to do it. This is what's fair. This is what's not. But I would have realized that the anger and the emotion themselves have this huge consequence. It's just completely unnecessary. Um, so now I'm just trying to f- learn from that and to do the same things that I think are the right thing to do. Uh, but to do them without anger and to do them with a very long-term point of view. Um, so I think if you take a very long-term point of view and if you take the emotion out of it, then uh, I wouldn't consider those things mistakes anymore. Um, other than that, I mean, the, there was a, you know, the, the perspective I like to adopt is that everything that I did and everything that was done to me, um, and, you know, there's some impossible to separate combination, brought me to this exact moment here today talking to you. And uh, this is a good moment. So it's a great moment. Whatever, yeah. <laughs> so whatever set of circumstances conspired to bring us here, we're good because here I am. Was there a moment you would say when you realized that you could control how you interpreted? I mean, I think one of the the problems that a lot of people have is they don't recognize that they can control not what happens to them per se, but how they respond and how they interpret a situation. I think everyone knows it's possible. And the reason they know it's possible is um, there's a great Osho lecture that he calls the title, The Attraction of Drugs is Spiritual. And he talks about why do people do drugs, everything from alcohol, psychedelics, to cannabis, to you name it. Uh, And they're doing it to control their mental state. And they're doing it to control how they react. And sometimes it's worse and sometimes it's better. But some people drink because then they don't care as much or they, they're potheads because they can zone out. Or they do psychedelics so they can feel you know, very present or connected to nature or what have you. But the attraction of drugs is spiritual. So to some extent, we already know that we can control our internal state. We just use external bioactive substances to do it. Uh, and now there are a lot more techniques that are out there in the public domain, many of them dug up from uh, older times, but uh, you know these range from cognitive therapy and, and behavioral psychology to meditation to taking long walks in nature. You can control your mental state. It's just we're used to doing it by hacking our external circumstances to then come back around and control our mental state. Um, and, uh, for example, sitting on a, on a uh, there's a famous line that says that uh, all of man's problems arise because he can't sit by himself in a room for 30 minutes. Pascal, Obviously, yeah. same class to women, too. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, you know, if a, if a man or a woman can sit by themselves on a cushion for 30 minutes, and that's hard, it's really hard to do, that's meditation, Um, you are essentially struggling with and controlling your internal state. And the first thing, the first thing to realize is that you can actually observe your mental state. So just the, 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 the advantage of meditation is not that you're suddenly going to gain the superpower to control your internal state. It's that you will recognize just how out of control your mind is. It is like a monkey flinging feces that's running around the room, <laughs> making trouble, shouting, breaking things. It's completely uncontrollable. It's an out-of-control mad person. 
Uh, and you have to see this mad creature in operation before you feel a certain distaste towards it and you start separating yourself from it. And in that separation is liberation. When you realize that, oh, I don't want to be that person. I, why am I so out of control? Just that awareness alone calms you down. Um, so there are, there are many techniques one can use. Another one, for example, that I think a lot of smart people say is if, if you're angry about something or if you get an unhappy email and you want to respond, don't respond for 24 hours, right? What does that do? It just, you, you're, you calm down. You the emotions subside, the hormones go down and your mental, you're in a better mental state 24 hours later. So uh, I think people already know this. Um, but we just don't act on it because socially we're not conditioned to act on it. Socially we're told go work out, go look good because that's a multiplayer competitive game. Other people can see if I'm doing a good job or not, or we're told go make money, uh, go buy a big house again, external multiplayer competitive game. But when it comes to, uh, learn to be happy, train yourself to be happy, completely internal, no external progress, no external validation. 100% you're competing against yourself, single player game. Uh, and we're such social creatures, we're more like bees or ants, that we're externally programmed and driven, uh, that we just don't know how to play and win at these single player games anymore. We compete purely on multiplayer games. But the reality is life is a single player game. You're born alone, you're gonna die alone, all your interpretations are alone, all your memories are alone, and you're gone three generations, nobody cares. Before you showed up, nobody cared. It's all single player. I think Buffett has a great example of that when he gives the, uh, do you want to be the world's best lover and known as the worst or the world's worst lover and known as the best in reference to an inner or external scorecard? Exactly right. I mean, all the real scorecards are internal. And, and the sad thing is, you know, we sit there like jealousy. Jealousy was a very hard emotion for me to overcome. Uh, when I was young, I had a lot of jealousy in me. Uh, and by and by, you know, I, 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 I learned to get rid of it. And it still crops up every now and then. But it's such a poisonous emotion because at the end of the day, you're no better off. You're unhappier. And the person you're jealous of is still successful or good looking or whatever they are. But the, the real breakthrough was for me was when I realized at a, at a personal fundamental level. I mean, I, the problem with these kinds of podcasts is I can give glib answers all day long, but you have to discover your own personal answer because your personal answer is going to be different than mine. It'll speak to you. But the one that I discovered that spoke to me was a day I realized that all of these people that I was jealous of, I couldn't just cherry pick and choose a little aspects of their life. I couldn't say, I want his body, I want her money, I mm. want uh, his personality. You have to be that person. Do you want to actually be that person with all of their reactions, their desires, their family, their happiness level, their outlook on life, their self image? And if you're not willing to do a wholesale 24 seven, 100% swap with who that person is, then there's no point in being jealous. I think that's a and great so, way to look at it. Once I came to that realization, je jealousy sort of faded away because I don't want to be anybody else. I'm perfectly happy being me. And by the way, even that is under my control, to be happy being me. It's just there's no social rewards for it. But there's a lot of internal rewards. <laughs> yeah, there's, it's, it's almost anti-social rewards because when you're, tr when you're working on your inner stuff, people don't love that. <laughs> it's not they don't dislike it. Your friends, of course, support you, but they're not getting anything out of it. Uh, and even when I look at my own uh, peer group and to the extent that they're working on themselves and, and everyone in their 40s at some level is, most of them are engaged in group activities. Hey, let's do a group meditation. Hey, let's go to this group event. Hey, let's go to this group lecture. And I keep coming back to this one line that I read, like everything I just read, but um, which was said, only the individual transcends. Nobody reaches enlightenment or, 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 or internal happiness or does serious internal work in group settings. Uh, it is a very lonely kind of task. Uh, and so to some extent, I think that people who are constantly looking for social affirmation in their internal work aren't that serious about it. What just, and it's fine, I'm not judging, but just they're craving more social interaction than they're really craving internal work.